Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another enlightening episode of Med Synapse, the podcast where we uncover the mysteries of medicine and explore the frontiers of healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. Nigar, and I'm thrilled to guide you through today's captivating conversation on pediatric immunization strategies. Our guest today is a distinguished expert in the field of pediatrics, Dr. Chadia Bailey who has graduated from St. Joseph University in Beirut and Paris City, France, where she has practiced pediatrics in Paris and now in Beirut as a renowned pediatrician. Welcome, Dr. Chadia. Yeah, thank you, Niga, for having me. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful topic. It's our yeah, pleasure to have you. Now, let's begin with our podcast. Dr. Chadia, to begin with, what are the current trends in pediatric immunization strategies and how have they evolved in recent years? Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of uh, vaccines in the beginning. So the history, we, be, we began 200 years ago and it was uh, 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 Professor Plotkin said that we had a uh, woman uh, from uh, a Caucasian woman who uh, took uh, a lesion, a pustule from uh, a, a small pox virus and inoculated in the arm of their infants and of their child. And uh, then they, uh, they had a mild disease. And then uh, they didn't, when they encounter in the environment the smallpox virus, they didn't get the disease or they got a mild one. So here what we call this is uh, virulization. Then we have in the 18th century, the end of the 18th century, uh, Jenner and then he took the smallpox virus and he inactivated. So uh, he was a pioneer with Louis Pasteur and the rabies uh, uh, they uh, Pasteur inactivated the rabies uh, uh, virus. So we had uh, Joseph Metzer, a 10 year old uh, child who uh, got the rabies uh, via the, the dog. And the mother of Joseph Metzer told Pasteur that if he doesn't vaccinate him, he's gonna die. And then they, uh, Pasteur vaccinated him and it was a huge uh, success. Here we are in the 19th century. Then we have the 20th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, 1920, 1930, we have the anatoxin of the diphtheria and the anatoxin of the tetanus. So we aren't uh, taking the whole pathogen, we are taking the toxin of the pathogen and it's, we have an immune response, which is a protective immune response. Now the trend, for example, is to vaccinate the pregnant woman uh, uh, for the tetanus, the diphtheria and the acellular pertussis. So we have a passage of the antibodies via the placenta and then the infant will be protected. And then we have the, we, we give the primo vaccination and the immunization for diphtheria tetanus and uh, pertussis for the uh, infant. And then later we uh, have the TB, the TB tuberculosis with the bacille de calmette et guérin. Uh, uh, now the trends is to, uh, the trials are for a new TB vaccine because uh, the tuberculosis is still a, um, a threat and uh, is still causing uh, death. So uh, we are looking for a new vaccine for uh, the trials are now uh, elaborating a new vaccine for the tuberculosis. Uh, then we have the influenza vaccine, in inactivated influenza vaccine. Here we are in the 1930s. Now the trend with the uh, influenza vaccine is that each year uh, in February, uh, the epidemiologists and the scientists, they gather 
to elaborate what are the strains, the circulating strains. For example, we have H1, N1, H2, N3. We have uh, the B, two strains of the B. They, um, uh, and, and then we manufacture the uh, a yearly uh, vaccine. So now the trend actually is to, uh, they are looking at a universal vaccine who contain all the strains so in one, uh, we will get the vaccine once and not each year. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, the trials are working on this. Uh, this is the trend now with the influenza vaccine. Uh, then we'll talk uh, about the polio virus. Here we are in 1955, the inactivated uh, polio uh, virus. And now we have only the poliovirus one and the poliomyelitis is, uh, we, we have it in three countries. So soon uh, the world will be polio free, but uh, all this is done via the vaccines, the campaign, the national campaign of the vaccines that uh, uh, work well. Uh, then we have uh, the meningo and the pneumococcal uh, uh, pneumococcus, streptococcus pneumonia. Uh, here we have the polysaccharide. So we are taking a, a sugar a part from the pathogen and not all the pathogen. And then in 1995, they did what we call a glucuroconjugation. So they take the polysaccharide and put it on a protein and this will make a very good and uh, the efficacy of the vaccine will be uh, uh, will, will give a robust uh, immune uh, response so now for the streptococcus pneumonia which uh, give uh, which can cause disease throughout life but uh, mainly an invasive disease uh, in the first uh, two years uh, of uh, life now we have the uh, PC, uh, we, we had uh, PCV7, PCV13, now we have uh, PCV15. So it's uh, 15 uh, serotypes and it's, it's a very good uh, vaccine. We give it at uh, 2, 4, 6 and then the booster injection between uh, 11 and uh, 18 uh, months. Uh, then we have the meningo, the meningo cock. Uh, here we have uh, the meningo ACYW, uh, four serotypes, and the, men the meningo uh, B. So the meningo ACYW, it's uh, Nimarix and Menactra. And the meningo B was uh, discovered by uh, reverse, what we call reverse uh, vaccinology. So here uh, we are seeing the DNA, the genome of the pathogen uh, in, uh, uh, in the screen of the scientist. And then he go and he, he can choose. We have, for example, 600 uh, antigen. He choose the antigen that will make the best immune uh, uh, response. Uh, so because the meningo B uh, is, is most uh, prevalent, more prevalent than the uh, ACYW. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the rotavirus. The rotavirus here, we have a Finnish scientist uh, who, who worked a lot on the rotavirus in 1983. And uh, then we had the, uh, uh, at uh, 2000, uh, year 2000, we had so the Rotarix and the Rotatec. The Rotarix, we give it at two and uh, three months, uh, before six months, and the Rotatec two, three, four, before eight months. And it's a very good vaccine. It prevents 30,000 deaths uh, per year, practically. Uh, and it's a oral vaccine. Now the trend is uh, they are looking for an injectable uh, vaccine. Um, so they, uh, 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 the trials actually are looking for an injectable uh, vaccine. Uh, and we have the HPV, human papilloma virus. 
HPV, we have cervarix and we have Gardasil, and now we have uh, nine uh, serotypes of, uh, uh, of Gardasil, uh, and it's a very good vaccine. Uh, uh, Australia did a, a national uh, campaign yeah, so for uh, the human papilloma virus vaccine. So we give it uh, to the teen um, between uh, the age 11, 11 year and 14 year. Uh, and uh, uh, we are vaccinating now the girls and the boys and the efficacy of the vaccine is 100 uh, percent. So here we, ha we have covered and then we'll talk about the COVID-19, uh, if you want, Dr. Nigar. Uh, we have covered, um, yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, we will say mainly that it had be it became a multidisciplinary uh, expertise we have scientists, we have immunologists, we have epidemiologists, we have the private sector and we have the public sector, we have the donors. So the birth of what we call the GAVI, the GAVI it's uh, governments, we have, um, uh, we have also uh, don't call all this partnership with the WHO. Uh, and uh, it, it was uh, a very good step because like this we have a manufacturing and a distribution of vaccine for the high and low income uh, countries, so for the uh, whole uh, world. Dr. Chadia, thank you so much for your brief introduction on the pediatric immunization strategies and the history and how they have evolved in the recent years. Now, moving on to our next question, what are the key considerations when developing a pediatric immunization schedule for patients? Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to look at the age, uh, if we have an infant, if we have a child, if we have a teen, uh, and uh, we're uh, going to look if he is a healthy child, he has uh, comorbidities, the treatments that he is going, uh, with the anterior vaccines, uh, uh, which anterior vaccines uh, was uh, done and um, uh, the timing and spacing of vaccines because if we have uh, two uh, attenuate, live attenuated virus uh, vaccine, we, we must uh, give a, a space of uh, one month. Uh, and uh, we talk about uh, the allergic reaction, uh, if we had a, uh, a reaction uh, which uh, involved more than two organs, uh, a severe uh, allergic reaction or not, uh, if uh, it was a mild uh, reaction or benign reaction. So uh, these are the main, uh, the main things to consider. Now, moving on to our next question, Dr. Chadia, could you please explain the importance of vaccine hesitancy and how it affects pediatric immunization rates? And what strategies can healthcare professionals employ to address this issue? Yeah, the hesitancy uh, is old. Uh, from the beginning of the establishment of vaccines, uh, there is a hesitancy to take uh, a vaccine. But we have now what is called the uh, GMP, the Good Manufacturing Practice. These are rules, are guidelines established by the WHO, and we have uh, national authorities, we have independent committees, so uh, everybody is looking at the vaccines and is looking at the if we want to take uh, paracetamol we have to uh, uh, the fda to agree the ema the european medicine agency to agree so uh, we don't take vaccines or a drug without these procedures so we have the research and we have rules and we have authorities and we have governments and we have so uh, it's really a partnership uh, now and we there is something uh, the trials we have what we call a pre-trial the pre-trial is done with the animals for example if you have the a safety of uh, 59 percent and not uh, 60 
uh, of so you you have to have the safety of 60 percent and not 59 59 it's a non-go uh, we don't continue to work with uh, the vaccine then we have the trials and the, we have three phases in the trials phase one phase two phase three phase one we have 100 uh, a person then phase two then uh, phase three we have uh, practically 45,000 uh, uh, person in the phase phase three so for example with the covid 19 vaccine we had a trials with 50,000 person before uh, before uh, the manufacturing of the uh, the vaccine and uh, 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 we, we have this to uh, consider so uh, when we do a vaccine we look at the safety of the, the vaccine now moving on to our next question are there any specific vaccines or vaccine combinations that are particularly important in the pediatric population today and why yeah sure we have for example the diphtheri tetanus pertussis uh, polio hemophilus influenza uh, hepatitis b uh, it's a six valent vaccine uh, and this vaccine we give it at two four six months and then between 11 and a booster injection 11 and 18 months and we have the tetravalent vaccine at five years and then we have between 11 and 13 years uh, and then we have uh, at 25 years 45 65 and the elderly each 10 years so uh, the trend now is to vaccinate all the population all the ages and not only the child we have to look at the elderly also uh, we are looking now the trend is to look how to make a robust vaccine for the elderly uh, also because we have a senescence of the immune uh, response i wanted to uh, add something about the uh, the new trends is the uh, phenotyping and the essays and the cytometry uh, of the immune response so now we know exactly for example the cells we know uh, the cytokines uh, uh, we, we can we can know the quantity and the phenotypes of all this reaction and these essays are, le are really uh, key uh, now in the immunology field and for uh, uh, we have vaccination uh, combination vaccination like the MMR measles mumps uh, rubella and we had we have the vaccines like uh, for example uh, uh, the covid-19 now uh, comirnaty uh, it's uh, a vaccine for the uh, sub variant of the omicron because we know that omicron and its sub variants is very infectious uh, less lethal but is, uh, is, is very infectious and the uh, protection, uh, we can have the protection with the uh, Comirnaty uh, uh, now. Dr. Chadia, how do you approach mm -hmm. educating parents and caregivers about the benefits and potential risks of the pediatric vaccines to ensure informed decision making? Yes. We want to say something that in the 20th century, between the beginning and the end of the 20th century, uh, we have we had three tools. We have hygiene, we have antibiotics, and we had vaccines. And with these three tools, in just uh, 100 years, we had gained a life expectancy of 35 years. So it's excellent. So if we take now the vaccines one by one, for example, the rotavirus vaccine, the rotavirus vaccine, uh, the children uh, get the infection, but they don't get the severe disease. So uh, it prevents 30,000 deaths per year. The HPV, the efficacy of the vaccine is 100%. 
So, for example, Australia did a national campaign for HPV and it was very successful. So, in the years, in the coming years, uh, the, the, the HPV uh, will, uh, we ha will have the success of the Cervarix and the Gardasil line uh, serotypes. Now, moving on to our final question of the day. In the context of COVID-19 pandemic, how have pediatric immunization strategies adapted and what should new resident doctors or new practicing doctors be aware of when dealing with vaccine distribution and administration? Yes. So uh, here in Lebanon, in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the UNICEF and the Ministry of Public Health established uh, a national program for vaccinating the children. And it was a very successful uh, experience. So we can get the vaccine via the pharmacies, but we can get also the vaccines via the Ministry of Public Health. And it's uh, given for free. So it was a very good experience. And now, for example, in our ce uh, cell phone, we have an application which is called Ucool, and we can monitor the temperature of our vaccines in the uh, refrigerator. So it's uh, excellent because we have the temperature must be between two and eight degree. It was a very successful um, experience. Uh, for, for the residents, uh, all uh, they are implicated. They are implicated from the third uh, cycle of uh, medicine. Um, and when we have a crisis, so they, uh, uh, residents are implicated, the students are implicated, um, uh, in the pharmacies, uh, the pharmacists also. So uh, it's uh, really, um, it, everybody is, um, is dealing with the, the, the crisis. At Institut Pasteur, we have a course for the physicians uh, or the vaccinologists, uh, a course of two months. And here we have uh, the scientists from all, all, all over the world. And it's very interesting. So for people who want to dive into the field of uh, vaccinology. Dr. Chadia, a very big thank you for sharing your knowledge on pediatric immunization with us today. Your expertise has truly enriched our conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nigar. We're looking forward to many more podcasts together on our platform. Thank you so much. Yeah. And to our valued audience, your support means everything to us. Remember to like, subscribe, and engage on our MedSynapse platform. Together, let's keep these enlightening discussions alive. Stay informed, stay healthy, everyone. Goodbye, and until next time. Thank you.